Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's Word that we're going to focus on this morning was the second Bible reading we heard from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 to 18. As we have meditation on that word, let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of family. Through your word, through your work, make us a part of your family, washed clean, made new, made holy by the one who is holy. In your name we pray. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, So family is a pretty good thing, isn't it? And family is something you're also stuck with, isn't it? Family is something you're born into. And you can't change that. You can't change who your parents were. But then again, we know that being with family can often be very difficult. It doesn't take much to make you ashamed of another member of the family. And maybe there's just someone who has perpetual problems that you just don't want to be around. You know, maybe it is the maybe it is the addict. addict. Maybe it is the liar. Maybe it is the manipulator. Maybe it is the moocher. Maybe it is the jailbird. Maybe it is the spoiled brat who always gets what they want. We have these people in our family and sometimes we make a point of distancing ourselves from them. We may be the one who people try to stay away from. Maybe we're the one who's estranged. Maybe we're the one who creates that tension, creates that hardship. Maybe we're the one who tries to gather the rest of the family together to push the other person away and make them estranged. It's kind of where you can find family sentiments such as this. It reminds me of a movie quote. Uh, where two sisters are arguing whether or not their parents play favorites, and the younger sister, who's convinced that they do, just says, well, have you ever listened to our parents introduce us? This is our daughter, Dottie. This is our other daughter, Dottie's sister. Family is anything but perfect, this side of heaven. We have our faults, we have our problems, and we know that. Family's not perfect. What about God's family? You know, we started talking about that, talk, talk about that with the kids up here this morning, but what makes you a part of God's family? And Megan gave an answer, and I'm pretty sure all of us would say that to some degree, to some effect. We are part of God's family because he created us. It's kind of like just how you're born into a family. You can't change that. Someone made you, God made you. And it's as if to say, you're part of God's family because God said, I made you, so that's it. That's all there is to it. Accept it. But does that necessarily make you family? Think about other situations in life. Think about other people being born to parents. Sometimes because of financial reasons, maybe emotional reasons. Some parents who have children have to give their children up because they can't care for them. They give them up for adoption. They give them into a new family. Or, God forbid, you see the other side. Parents who don't want their kids. Parents who ignore their kids. Parents who abandon their kids. And it works the other way, too. Children can decide at a certain point in their life, I'm going to leave this family. I'm going to get away from them. I'm not going to call them. I'm not going to contact them. I'm just leaving and starting a new family or being a part of a different family. And we know this is sometimes done just because there are bad things going on. Maybe a parent disowns a child or a child just runs away from home. I can't deal with this anymore. Family is more than just a connection of who we're born to. So when it comes to God's family, is it really just enough to say, well, God created us, therefore we are part of God's family? I wonder, just like in our families, if we do something that embarrasses others, that makes them ashamed of us, that estranges us from them, 
Is there anything we've ever done in our lives that would estrange us from God? That would make God ashamed of us? Let me think about that for a minute. Has there ever been something I have said or done or thought that would make God ashamed of me? If God still is out here holding up his standard of perfection, that's what he says it takes to be a part of his family. You have to be perfect. Every second, every day, he accepts nothing less. And he's everywhere at all times. That means he knows exactly everything you've thought. He knows the deepest, darkest thoughts you've had. The words that you thought that you wanted to say, but you knew you couldn't. When you thought you were all alone and you were in a dark place and you thought no one else would know about this, God knew. God saw it. Think about all the things God knows about you, but all the bad things he knows about you. If God were to stand up here today and start just reading, well, you know, this is what you've done. You did this on this day, this on this day, this on this day, went down through the whole list. Could we even show our face in public? Sin has entered into the world when we are sinners. We came into this world that way. Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. That means I am rebellious against God. That means I do things that are disobedience. I, I, I work against him and I push my way out of his family and kind of storm off as if I can take on the world all by myself and I don't need anyone else. The things I have done, the things you have done, the things we have done, they destroy family. They destroy our relationship with God. And rightly for the things I've said, the things I've done, the things I've thought, God should be ashamed of me. Hold me at an arm's length. Unfriend me off of Facebook, whatever it is. Why would he want anything to do with me? That's what I did. But what did God do? All the things I did to push myself away from his family, and yet this is what he did. We see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, and now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he may break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus, God from all eternity, God with no beginning and no end, God from whom everything was created and for everything was created, took on human flesh and blood. The immortal God became mortal for the sole purpose that he might taste death for everyone. That he, by his life and then his death, would provide a sacrifice that would break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Because <coughs> that's the thing, the devil, he knows us too. He's seen what we've done. He doesn't know everything like God, but he has plenty of evidence to submit before God, say, hey, do you know what, what Pastor Klein did? Let me read to you what he did today. There's no way you should love him. There's no way you should accept him. You should cast him out and never have anything to do with him again. And Satan has every right to accuse us that way. But then Jesus shared our humanity. God from all eternity took on human flesh so that he would shed his blood, so his blood would cover over that list of accusations 
that everything the devil wanted to hold against us and prove this is why they should never be a part of God's family, Christ's blood covers over every single one. It's rendered all of the devil's, devil's accusations null and void. It means that there is nothing that the devil can bring up, there is nothing that the devil can talk about that can then make God push you out of his family. This is what atonement is. Christ shedding his blood to cover over all of our sins, all of our offenses, all of our wicked acts, our rebellion, our disobedience, every bit of it. And because he tasted death for us, he now is the one who not only is holy by his pure, perfect, sinless life, but he is the one who makes people holy that he cleanses us with that blood so that we are washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. That's why Jesus says through this author to the letter of the Hebrew Christians, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He is the one who is holy. He is the one who makes people holy. And he, by what he has done, his life, his death, his blood shed for us because he shared that humanity, that is what has made us clean and that is what has made us a part of God's family. Because of what Christ has done, he does not hold us out at an arm's length. He's not saying, you're too sinful, I can't accept you, I can't have you. Instead, he draws us to himself. He brings us to us and very unashamedly, very much with pride and joy, says, these are my brothers and my sisters. Because I have made them holy. I have washed them clean. They are a part of my family, not just because I created them, but because I saved them. That's what Jesus did for us. That's why he took on human flesh, not as if to show us a way, but to be the way. To be the one who could taste death for everyone, and then knowing that after that he rose from the dead, and from there ascended back into heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. This position of power and authority is emphatically telling us, yes, our high priest has made that sacrifice of himself. And so we are washed clean. We are made part of his family. God will never be ashamed of us because of what he has done for us. Because when we're honest with ourselves, we often don't have a very high self-esteem. We know that we've done wrong. We know that we've sinned. We know there are things that we have done that God has every right to be ashamed of us, to cast us away. But instead of making us subject to eternal death, to be separated from God forever, he wants you to know it's not about what you think of yourself. It's not about how much you tried to make God proud. But instead, it's entirely what he did for you. That we're not stuck in this perpetual cycle trying to please him as a parent. But to know as Jesus himself said, it is finished. My life lived for you. My blood shed for you. All of those accusations, all of those sins, all of that wickedness, all that disobedience. I remember it no more. It's taken care of. You are a part of my family. Because I have bought you with my blood, I have cleansed you and made you pure, so I am proud to call you my brother or my sister. This is how we are made a part of God's family. This is a fact that we very much can rejoice over every single day, knowing that's not dependent on me, on what I do, what I think of myself, but on what God has done for me. That he has made me a part of his family. That he is the one who is holy and the one who has made us holy. And because of that, he will very proudly and very unashamedly always call us brothers and sisters. So we belong to him, a part of God's family. Amen. Please stand.
The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.